but I, would, I never planned to get to this point. I'm going to tell you exactly how I got there. But I also made a lot of mistakes in my 20s that were beautiful, iconic mistakes that I am going to explain to you. But to start off, find someone next to you. I know this is so annoying. I hate this too. I have social anxiety. But find someone next to you. Tell them the job that you think your like, parents and society would be proud of you for, the job you kind of think you should do. Like this kind of the safer job. And then give me the job that is your dream, like unrealistic. You might never be able to do it, but deep down as a little girl, it's what you wanted to do. So do it now. I'm going to give you guys a couple of seconds. And I'm watching you, so you better do it. <laughs> Okay, enough, enough. Thank you. I love that. I hope you weren't just gossiping the whole time. Does anyone want to share their one, their two things that they decide? I'm obsessed with you. Wow. Also, are we wearing the same top? Amazon, $33. I'm obsessed with you. What is the job that you can see yourself doing, society wants you to do, and what's your, like, dream job? travel blogger. I'm obsessed with that. Okay. I don't know about you guys, but I got feels. I kind of got like tingles when you said that. And I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about my story first, and then we're going to get into your guys' stories. So I decided at eight years old, I wanted to be a professional tennis player. I was obsessed. She was an athlete. I was, had a lot of hyperactivity. Probably looking back now, I was severe ADHD, but we didn't know that back then in the day. <laughs> We don't have TikTok to diagnose you. So I decided, a coach told my parents she's too old to become a professional tennis player at eight years old. I cried all day and I spent the next probably 11, 12 years determined to become a professional tennis player. And I dealt with a lot of performance anxiety. I loved playing, but I got so nervous on the court. I ended up going to Florida being ranked like top 150 in the world. I ended up getting a full scholarship to University of Wisconsin. Tennis was my identity, go Badgers, thank you. <laughs> and everyone was like, Hannah's this amazing tennis player. And I was good, but deep down I wasn't happy, but I didn't understand that I didn't have to do it. And I also, this is a little, this is gonna sound weird, but just cause you're really good at something doesn't mean it's what you're meant to do. And that is wild, but we have a lot of beautiful multifaceted women in here that you don't even know something that you could be amazing at. So after college, I was playing number one for University of Wisconsin, and I just felt empty. And I decided I wanted to try to do sports broadcasting in their kind of like internship role. And I loved it. I loved being on camera. I loved talking sports. I learned how to edit. And I loved when it was posted on YouTube and people would see me and I'd be, I'm like smiling talking about it. But I thought, I'm from New York, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. I don't want to go to a small town to become a sports broadcaster. I miss my family. I'm going to New York City. I'm putting that dream away. Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> not to quote the OG Oprah, but she talks about whispers, and I think whispers are really important. Whispers are that thing in your head that are telling you something that you can ignore or you can listen to. Sometimes they're anxiety. Sometimes they're an annoying like roommate voice that is just causing us fear. But sometimes it's that little girl that loves to perform or loves to travel or you know, loves to heal people. And it's your job to really be able to listen to your voice versus all the other voices that you've heard 
since you were born, whether it be coaches, teachers, your asshole uncle who didn't believe in you, your mom who was dealing with her own stuff and projected it on you. Anyway, so I, I truly believe that I got back to New York and my dad's in sales and I wanted to show him I could be good at sales too. And I went from being captain of the tennis team to doing cold calling sales. And my dad said, everyone needs to experience cold calling. This is my impression of my dad. Experience cold calling, and that's how you know you're tough. You do cold calling. Turns out I actually was pretty good at cold calling, I, but I hated it. I would like sell a deal and then go in the bathroom and literally sit there. And I hated asking people for stuff. I liked to create. I didn't like to take. And I did that for a whole year. And I made money. I made six figures in my first job. And I was miserable. And I decided I wanted to quit to do marketing. I thought marketing's more creative. So I joined a very small company selling t-shirts. And turns out the boss did not care about my ideas. He kind of just wanted me to do customer service the whole time. And it was worse than sales because I didn't even have an excitement of a high or a low of a loss. I just was bored as shit. Um, <laughs> thank you. So. I quit my job because I was actually in Vegas at like a t-shirt convention. Thank you, it was embarrassing. And then, <laughs> and you know when you're just standing there and you're like, how did we get here? And I was messing around on my computer. We were like putting in orders at like midnight. Also, I was getting paid. My salary was probably around like 50K at that point. I was 24. And I, an old Wisconsin sports broadcasting video popped up and I thought, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. So I quit my job. And my boss literally laughed in my face. And he's like, if you wanted a raise, you should. Like, he just, he kind of just was like, we don't need you anyway, so it's fine. So I had no job at 25. And my friends were judgy. I have to, like, there had, you, or maybe I projected it on them, but I felt like people were like, what's going on with Hannah's life? She was this great tennis player. She has no job at 25. She's not making money. She's lost. But I knew that I'd rather be at the beginning of nothing than on the wrong path. I'm going to use a little metaphor. It's like surfing. If you try to surf the wrong waves, you can work your hardest, but it's going to be a rough day out at sea. But if you find the right wave, it's going to be effortless, and it's going to be joyful, and it's going to be beautiful. This is a surf TED talk now, um, so welcome. <laughs> so I took an unpaid internship at 25, editing for a sports video company. And <laughs> I just did it to be able to say, like, I'm getting some experience. And then I don't know if you guys are familiar with the company Betches, but I basically manifested, I want to do video. And in two years, I was on a national television show. And I'm not trying to say I'm a witch or magical or like whatever crystals I used. I'm gonna tell you exactly like how I did it. And it took me quitting my job. I closed that door and I truly told everyone that I wanted to get into video. There's a reason why I made you guys uncomfortably turn to someone. Because when you say it out loud, it's not a dirty little secret. It's not something that you're embarrassed about. Say it out loud and see someone receive it. This shit is real. And we have one life, and you guys are learning. You probably maybe had your first job or not a job yet, but that goes on a lot. And there's a lot of 25-year-olds who have a quarter-life crisis. It's, it really happened to a lot of my friends. They quit their job, they moved to Thailand, they become a yoga instructor. She's laughing. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. Because you do the job you thought you were supposed to do, and then you go, I can't live the rest of my life this way. And as you don't have to prove to anyone that you could do well in a corporate job. You don't have to prove that to anyone. You can do it. Why don't you do what you really want to do? Because I'm telling you, if you love it, we're killing it. We're going to kill it. So I told a lot of people I want to get into video. I would just say in a conversation, I'd talk to people. I lived that reality. That's what I'm doing. I want to get into video. Someone messaged me, said, hey, Betches is looking for someone with five years of experience 
in video. And I kind of said, that's not me. I did editing for like six months and I have a pretty crappy internship right now. There's something that people talk about of guys versus girls that guy, girls tend to take jobs they're overqualified for. And that's really true. Even think about who we date sometimes. Like, look, guys will go for these girls that are out of their league, and girls will be like, okay, I'll fix him, I'll make it work. <laughs> I mean, a little too relatable, right? Go for jobs you're unqualified for. And I'm going to tell you how I got this job at Betches. I submitted a funny video, and I guess it was, they liked it. They liked my voice. I go in, and they are like, honey, you have zero experience. But I came in with, like, 30 video ideas. Because these are just my ideas. So I literally showed them what I was going to do. I said, this is my performance. And they said, okay, you have no experience. We're going to pay you $300 a week. And I could not have been happier. Because in that moment, I said, I found the wave. I found my wave. I'm ready to go. And I'm even getting shivers right now talking about it. Because my life changed from that moment. And I'll be honest, I wasn't great at making videos in the beginning. They were giving me different guidance. They told me not to put my face in videos. I was making like worded videos, but it was my boot camp. I was learning how to write jokes. I was learning how to make viral videos. I was learning about marketing and I loved it. Fast forward, I did get fired from that job. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you guys about that too. So I start interviewing people at the company. Like I started an interviewing channel and I meet some members of a reality TV show, and I interview to be on a reality TV show. I never thought I would do reality TV. I'm pretty scared of confrontation. <laughs> pretty bad at confrontation, I just start crying. Um, but I wanted to show that women could be more than just like the hot girl, or the messy girl, or the mean girl, or you know, the relatable girl. I wanted to show that women could be sexy, but depressed, but insecure but confident. Reality TV isn't necessarily the best space to do that, but I wanted to get the chance to put myself out there and to be seen. I always think I was not qualified for reality TV, I wasn't qualified for Betches, but I said, let's fucking go, let's do it. Because you know what, what's the worst that can happen? You leave or get fired. So at Betches, um, they did not love that I wanted to do reality TV and I got fired. And I love that job. I was like, I'm going to do this forever. I'm going to be making Betches videos forever. That's how you think when you're young. You're like, this is me now. I was broken. I was so upset. And I had pitched them a podcast too, Burning in Hell, where it's a mental health comedy podcast. And I said, do you guys want to do it with me? with me? And they were like, no. So I did that on my own. And I went on reality TV and my platform started to grow. And during that time, I fell in love with stand-up comedy. Because Burning in Hell is a podcast, and people started to do live podcasts. So Caroline's in New York City, a comedy club, said, Hannah, can you do a live podcast? And my friend said, I dare you to do 10 minutes of stand-up. Because I've been writing tweets and writing jokes for so long. So I took all my tweets, and I said, these are about, you know, dating. This is about food. This is about cats. It's about astrology. I'm like, I can do a 10-minute set. Turns out in comedy, people spend like years to get their 10 minutes set. But these are rules made by archaic men, I have to say. <laughs> Think of stand-up. It's invented by just white men talking on stage. And we need to find our own way that's right for our own unique minds. So I went on stage. I did 10 minutes of stand-up in front of 300 people. Looking back, it probably wasn't that great, but it was the most fun I'd had. And that wave was going. I was surfing. I was beach boys in, you know? So that was another old reference. I apologize. And then I get on Summer House. And I start to get a following. And I now have the independence. I have no, no boss. And I'm not going to lie. I loved it. I loved not having a boss. I kind of have manifested for myself that I never want to have a boss again. And... That's also just because I'm a Leo. And fast forward, I got fired from somewhere else. <laughs> fast forward three years, I was doing so much comedy. I was being myself. And it wasn't meant for me anymore. 
When you're being authentically yourself, you're gonna outgrow places. You're gonna outgrow relationships, friendships, workplaces. You're not supposed to have the same job for 30 years. We're not, you know, in a, an old school environment like that, especially the creative minds that are here. And I didn't take any of this stuff personally because I knew this is not where I am thriving right now. So I got fired from Summer House and I started my comedy tour. And I also started a podcast with my friend Giggly Squad that now is getting hundreds of thousands of listens. We have almost 10 million listens total now. And it all stems from that little girl who threw herself into tennis. And I could look back and be like, I'm a failure. I didn't become a professional tennis player. But if I really think back, I love to paint. I love to make my family laugh. I love to create. I was always an artist. So I want my story to be an example for you guys of how, I hate to use the word failing, but truly failing forward, I found myself. I found myself where I'm supposed to be. It's like when you're, you see your friend get broken up with by a dude who's like the worst and they're so upset and you're like, you didn't want it. You don't see it now, but you don't want that. 